Alicia, come up here. I'm just doing something different. I'm just doing something different uh, this morning. Uh, get your Bible. If, or somebody give her a Bible. Throw a Bible at her. There we go. And let's see here. I'd like for you to read Matthew chapter 27, verses 34, all the way to verse 66. Okay? Open your Bible and read with her this morning. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation, written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, and another on the left, and they passed by and they passed by reviled him wagging their heads and saying thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days save thyself if thou be the son of god come down from the cross likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said he saved others himself he cannot save if he be the king of israel let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him he trusted in god let him deliver him now if he will have if he will have him for he said i am the son of god the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the name in his, cast the same in his teeth now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour and unto, and about the ninth hour jesus cried with a loud voice saying eli eli lama sabachthani that is to say my god my god why has why hast thou forsaken me some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which, saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went unto the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come there the, uh, came a rich man of Aramea, Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph, and Joseph, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that thou, that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people he has risen from the dead so the last error shall be worse than the first Pilate said unto them you have a watch go your way make it sure as you can so they went and made the sepulchre, sepulcher sure sealing the stone and setting a watch all right thank you very much I'd like the rest of you to take your Bible turn to the gospel of John if you would John chapter 21, that portion of scripture gives us the story of the death 
and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you believe the Bible this morning? Say amen. amen. And I want you to, um, just for a moment this morning, I want you to put, put it in your mind, your mindset, if you would. I want you to sort of draw a picture. Or make a film, make a movie in your mind of how Peter and the other disciples, excluding, of course, Judas Iscariot, who by, by now has hung himself for betraying Christ. But I want you to just sort of make a little film in your mind of what it would be like to be one of those disciples, you have invested three, three and a half years of your life. You left nets on the beach and um, you walked away from your employment. You walked away from nets full of fish. You walked away from family. You walked away from all of that in order to follow this man named Jesus. You believed that he was the Messiah, the chosen one of God. You believed that he was the Holy One of Israel. You believed that at some point Christ was going to free the people of Israel from uh, the tyranny that they were under Rome. And, you, and try to remember this that uh, ever since the days of King Manasseh, and even, even before that, the days of Ahab and so on, that the Jews, for the most part, most part had been in bondage. Uh, the ten northern tribes were taken up into Assyria and scattered all over the place. Judah and Benjamin were taken up into Babylon for 70 years. And when they came back, even at that time, they really didn't rule over themselves. And by the time Jesus comes around, they have Romans ruling over them. And Caesar is king now over the uh, people of Israel. And so uh, as a disciple, you're, you're sort of thinking to yourself that at surely this man is going to be the man that is going to free us from the bondage that we are in, establish his kingdom, because that's what they ask in the first chapter of the book of Acts. Is that, will you now at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? And Jesus responded back to them and said, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath in his hand. In other words, uh, I'm not doing it now, and when I do it, you're not going to know about it. I'm not going to tell you ahead of time. Um, but anyway, these men followed Jesus. They gave everything that they had. They... They sacrificed all to follow him, and now Jesus is dead. And they didn't see that coming. Even though Jesus told them those very things. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be buried. And on the third day, he's going to rise again. Those ex ex very exact things. And the disciples, upon watching it all, they may have somewhat regarded what Jesus said, but for some reason, they just didn't take it to heart. It would be like some of you. Uh, we, kinda ex we almost experienced this a couple years ago when... Lindsay came to our house one night, one o'clock in the morning, saying our house was on fire. The thought of everything that my wife and I had built and done and put together over the last 30 some odd years, and that all of that could be taken away just like that, uh, that's, uh, that, that kind of sobers you up a little bit. And so the disciples here, they've invested all their life, all of their talents, everything that they have, they've invested into this man named Jesus, and now he's dead. And so what do you do after that? What do you do after that? Well, let me just tell you, and, and 
I actually wrote uh, the beginnings of a sermon yesterday, and um, me and Matthew and Caleb left for the uh, for the hockey game. And uh, while we're out traveling, driving up there, God changed the message, which means that after the game's over with, I get to go home and start working on a different message, which is why I'm a little bit sleepy-eyed this morning. But I hope you're, and, and I, as I was Going through this in my mind and what God was, the verses that God was giving me and so on. As I was going through this, I re I'm remembering the series that I've been preaching here lately. About the exodus from Egypt. The Israelites leaving Egypt, being freed from the bondage of Pharaoh, being freed from the bondage of sin. Being let go, wandering in the wilderness and yet constantly turning their back on God, constantly wanting to turn around and go back to Egypt. There's nothing for them there. Pharaoh's dead. Pharaoh's armies are dead. There really is nothing for them to go back to, and yet that's where they want to go. They want to go back. Over and over and over again, we see in the Scriptures. I, I, don't, I tried counting them, and I lost track of how many times the Jews ran into something that they thought was utterly impossible and then said, you know what, we're going to make us a captain. He's going to take us back to Egypt. The thought of giving up, the thought of, of not having or not achieving the promise that you were made may be in fact the reason why you haven't really yet turned everything over to God. There is a man that uh, I would not give his name except that he stood in this church and testified of what I'm about to tell you, but his name is Mike Henderson. He is uh, a man that I grew up with in this church, although he was a few years older than me. And uh, one day, many years ago, and I'm going to say around, my goodness, 1998, 1999, something like that, God laid it on my heart to go see him. And that, in fact, that's kind of what I heard. I heard these words, go see Mike Henderson. I didn't know where he was. As far as I know, he could have been in Kentucky because that's where his family had moved to or any place. I didn't know. And I remember uh, asking Rose where he was. And she said, he just lives over here across town over here by uh, Shapiro's junkyard. I said, are you kidding me? She said, no. So I looked up his address, found it, took Sterling with me that one night. We went over there and Talked to him for a little while. We talked about this, that, and the other. You know how when you're there to talk to somebody about the Lord, you got to talk through everything else first and then get to it. So we ended up in his living room, and I spent a good hour and a half trying to talk him back into coming to church and getting his life right with God. And I tried everything that I could. I mean, I was just pouring it on him. At one point... He said, can, can I get you to stop right there? He said, I really got to go to the bathroom. I said, okay. While he's gone, I'm shooting up flares to heaven. Say, hey, God, I need help down here. Uh, God, and I, here's what I pray. God, give me something that when I say it, it'll shut his mouth up right then. He will not be able to offer any objection whatsoever. And it will convince him that what I'm telling him is right. Because... Here's, what, here's the excuse he was using. He was saying, Mike, and he did not have a bad attitude about this. He said, Mike, you know that I've been in church all throughout my youth. And he said, you also know that I've been in church for a while, fall out. Get back in church a while, fall out. Get back in church a while, fall out. It was either alcohol or his drugs or his all, any number of things that would work in him and pull him out of the house of God. And I said, yeah, Mike, I know that. I said, but you know, God's not looking for people that are perfect and never do anything wrong. He's looking for people that will put their trust in him 
And I said, I know you know about trust and faith. And we're not saved by our works. And you're not going to be saved or unsaved by the deeds you do. You're going to be saved by grace. And you're going to be saved through faith. And during the course, so I prayed, God, give me something that it will just stop him in his tracks. Lo and behold, he come back from the bathroom. He sat down. We talked for a little while longer. And here it comes. And God gave me something to say to him to this day. I can't remember what it was. But as soon as I said it, he went. Man, I, I don't have anything to say about that. It stopped him in his tracks just like that. And so I said, Mike, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave. And I want you to remember everything I just said. And I said, today's Thursday. Why don't you come to church Sunday? He said, I just might do that. Well, he called me the next night, Friday night. He said, Mike, I got down on my face before God. He said, I made everything right with God. And he said, I confessed all my sins to him. I'll be there Sunday. He came, when he came that Sunday, he came down to the altar. He was just crying his eyes out. He was shaking. And God did a work in him. At the time, he had a real long, big ponytail. And I, I didn't say a word to him. By the time he showed up for the next church service, which I think was Wednesday night, he just took a pair of scissors and chopped that ponytail off and said, you know what, I know better than that. I ain't wearing one of them things and try to live for God and everything like that. And then he came a few years ago and visited this church and I asked for testimony and he stood up and he relayed that story that I just told you. You see, what was going on in his life was he had been in and out so many times. He was tired of the cycle of going to church, getting out of church, getting into sin, repenting, getting good and get back to church again, becoming a hypocrite, get out of church, go back into sin. He basically just gave up on coming back to church ever is what happened. He gave up. What he didn't realize was what we're going to see here this morning. Uh, boy, what turned my notes all there? If you look in Isaiah, in fact, turn to Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. If you don't know, those two chapters are right back to back to each other. I'm trying to help some of y'all that, that went to uh, DeSoto school. Amen. When you get there, let's pray. And again, I want you to have that picture in your mind that Everything that you had invested for the last three and a half years in Jesus, now Jesus is dead, and so what do you have to live for now? What are you going to do now? Jesus is dead and gone. There's nothing really to live for. What are you going to do? Father, we ask your blessings upon your word this morning. I ask you, God, Lord, to help me preach it. The way it should be preached. Uh, Lord, I believe this is the message you gave me. Pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that again, that you would open up the ears of those who are here. Teach us great and mighty things that we know not. I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here that has turned their back on you, God, that you would bring them back. God, that you would open up the gates of heaven, pour out blessings unto them. Let them know, God, that you're... In fact, you're, you're more real now than you ever were, even when you were on this earth. Lord, teach us that, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Now, I want you to notice this. Now, there is a theme in the Bible that God showed me many, many years ago, and it has everything to do with this story about Mike Henderson that I just told you. It has everything to do with what we just read out of... Uh, uh, part of it, the Gospel of Luke, uh, part of it, where was you reading from, Alicia? Matthew? Uh, part of it has to do with that, the idea that Christ died 
And to the disciples and everybody else that followed him, it looked like that it was the end. It was the end of everything. Those of us who are living here on this earth, when we think about death and dying, we tend to think that it is the end. But we as born again, Bible believing Bible knowing Christians ought to know down deep in our heart that death is not the end. It is the beginning of something greater than anything we've ever experienced in our life. If we are saved, say amen. In fact, if you're, if you live to be my great grandma Hoggard, Lorinda Sanders Hoggard, Lived to be 101 years old. She believed in her heart. She told all of us. She told her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. That she believed God promised her to live 100 years old. She surpassed that by a year. That was a woman who knew how to pray. Amen. God said, I'm not just going to give you 100. I'm going to give you an extra one. Just for asking me. Amen. But she lived to be 101 years old. If you live to be that long. You still have the life that you live is nothing compared to the life that she now lives in heaven's gates. Somebody say amen. In fact, Isaiah 65, 17. God said, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Now, I like traveling. I like seeing different places of the country. I have to admit, I've seen all of Iowa and Kansas that I wish to see. Corn, 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 corn. Soybeans, corn, corn, corn. I've seen all of that. I've seen the Grand Canyon twice. I've seen um, uh, Niagara Falls twice. I've seen man-made structures that are tremendous. I've seen natural formations that are absolutely beautiful. There are places in this world that I, I would love to see. I would love to go visit. The, the flesh part of me sees this world and thinks that it's absolutely beautiful. I think God did a good job creating this world, don't you? This world is beautiful when you go out, look at the stars by night, when you look at the sky during the daytime. By the way, a week from tomorrow, we're going to travel down a few miles from here. We're going to watch that, uh, watch that eclipse again. And uh, the one we had in 2017 was awesome. I'm hoping this is just as awesome. I like that kind of stuff. I've said that before. But that is none other than the hand of Almighty God that does that. Amen. And I just love seeing when God, what God does in the heavens, okay? But I'm here to tell you, this world and all of its uniqueness, all of the beauty of it, everything is nothing compared to what God has in store for us in heaven one of these days. Amen. It's nothing compared to what it is. So God said, for behold, I, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former... Meaning the old heaven and the old earth shall not be remembered nor come into mind. God said, you won't even think about my, that Grand Canyon. He said, you won't even think about it. Niagara Falls, well, that's nothing. I believe God's got waterfalls in heaven that will just absolutely just blow you away. The beauty of it. I believe God's got canyons up in heaven, mountains up there. I mean, I don't know what it all is up there. I just believe it's going to be absolutely beautiful and we'll never, ever get used to it. Amen. You know how you live in this real, or you get this really brand new car and you're just amazed at it. And two years time after the kids got in, ruined it. It don't smell like new car anymore. Amen. It smells like dirty diaper and McDonald's. God's got a place that will never stink. It is going to be beautiful. 
And even though we will have lost the old earth and the old heaven, we won't mind. Amen? Look at Isaiah 66. Turn to the next page. Four times. Four times God says this in the scriptures. Verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your, and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Now I believe that in this new heaven and new earth, nobody's going to miss church. Amen? Nobody's going to have a headache. Nobody's kids are going to have diarrhea. Amen? Nobody's car will refuse to start. It won't be too cold or too hot for you to get out. It will absolutely be the perfect place in which we are going to live and from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, we are all going to gather together freely and worship before God, giving Him all the praise and all the glory forever. Amen? If you're like me, uh, I could be, well, during COVID, when I caught COVID... There were three Sundays in a row that I just, I could not get out of bed. And I felt awful the first Sunday. Felt a little bit less awful the second Sunday. The third Sunday, I'm going, God, if you're going to kill me, get it over with. I don't want to live this like this anymore. But I came back to church having missed it because of that sickness. But in heaven, there will be no more sickness and none of us will miss the gathering together of God's saints. Amen. Amen. Now turn to Numbers chapter uh, 14. Some scriptures here. I'm going to read through, try to read through it very quickly for you. I'm setting up this idea for you, okay? I'm setting up this idea for you and I want you to pay attention to this. Numbers 14 verse 30. God said, doubtless you shall come, you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones which you said should be a prey, them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. Think about that for a minute. These people who left Egypt, left everything, left their houses, left everything, left the bondage of Egypt. They left everything in Egypt to follow Moses. And now, practically all of them, except two of them, Joshua and Caleb, are having serious regrets. Wouldn't that be something? To invest the majority of your life living for God. Only to turn yourself over to sin. Lose it all. And you would have to ask, what was it all for? What was it all for? There are people in this country, there are people who are our neighbors... They are people that we are friends with. They are people that we went to school with. They are people that we work with. That it probably at one time in their life went to a church, went into that church faithfully. They were there every Sunday. They were there most Wednesdays. They served on boards. They maybe it may have taught Sunday school. They may have sang in the choir or the worship band or whatever it is they have anymore. They may have 
uh, just served in various ways in that church. But something happened. Some, some people got upset. There was uh, uh, maybe um, a little jealousy on somebody's part. Maybe a little jealousy on their part. And all of a sudden, they just, after years of being part of that church, they just walk out and quit, having wasted those years serving in a church somewhere, walk away from it, never to come back again. Having lost all of that labor, all of that work, they may have invested money so that the church could expand its walls. And, and they felt good knowing that the, because of the bigger uh, because of the bigger sanctuary, now more people are coming in and they're filling those pews and it might give you a sense of satisfaction. But then you got offended and out the door you went and you, every time you drive by the place, you see that extension there on the side of the church knowing that you gave pretty much mo almost all the money for that thing to be built, but you get no benefit out of it whatsoever. To you, it's as good as dead. And you think... Why, God? Why did you let me do this? I'm going to tell you a true story. That um, the man who used to be Joyce Myers' voiceover man, his name is Mike Marks, and he had a ministry for a while called Big Mike Ministries. He was children's pastor at the same church that Joyce Meyer came out of, and uh, Jeff, uh, what's his name, is over there on Highway 30. But anyway, um, after Joyce left, uh, Mike went out on his own doing like uh, uh, children revivals. He did vacation Bible schools. He did Sunday school classes. He did all kinds of things related to children. That was his gift. And I befriended him for a while. We, we met up for lunch one day. And he said, I got a story to tell you. He said, I'm leaving the charismatic church. And I went, do what? He said, yes, sir, I'm walking out. I said, what happened? He said, it's fake, it doesn't work. And I'm going, well, I've known that, but let me hear, let me hear what you got to say. He said he knew a man at that same church, there in Fenton there, on, just off of Highway 30. And he said, this man gave large sums of money. This man had a big, thriving business, had a wife, had two kids, had a beautiful house. Cars, trucks, everything that every man could want. And he said, anytime they had one of those big, you know, those big seminars or those big revivals where they'd bring in people like Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagin or whatever, they'd bring those guys in, Rodney Howard Brown. Well, this man would give over large sums of money in order to take care of these men, to house them, to feed them, and to give them money and all that stuff. He did all of these things. One day he ended up sick. I don't know what the sickness was, don't know the nature of it. But the sickness didn't go away. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, it affected his business and he lost his business. Because he lost his business, he, they had to foreclose on this nice, I mean a million dollar house that this man lived in. They had to foreclose on the house. When they foreclosed on the house, his wife took his two children and left him and said, this is not what I had planned for the rest of my life to live in poverty with some guy that can't even hardly get his head up off the bed. She left him, took the boys, took everything else that he had. And this man now is living, I think it was living with one of his daughters or something like that. And I mean, he was just sick, had lost everything that he had. He goes to the pastor of that church up there. And he asked him, he said... You told me that if I operated in faith and if I gave so much and if I did so much in the church and if I did this and did that, did that, that God would bless me. And here it is. I've lost my health. I've lost my business. I've lost my family. I've lost my house. I've lost everything that I've had. Now you tell me what's wrong. Rick Shelton was his name. And Rick Shelton looked across that desk of his and looked that man in the eye and he said, obviously, there's something that you're holding back from God. In other words, I'm sorry, but it's your fault. Does that sound like grace to you? And that man, he told Mike, Big Mike this. 
He said, Mike, I will always believe in God. I will always believe in Jesus. I will never, ever, ever involve myself in another church that way the rest of my life. And in that sense, and I want to move on here. In that sense, it's the same as like the children of Israel in uh, Numbers 14. They've decided to go back to Egypt, turn around, turn against God. And God punished them. He said, for 40 years, you're going to walk in this wilderness and your carcasses are going to rot. Now, the children that you have, I'm going to take them into the promised land. They're going to see it. They're going to enjoy it. But you're not. And then he tells Joshua and Caleb, you're going to get to go in because you lived by faith. But the rest of your, your people of your generation, they're all going to die in this wilderness for 40 years. You're going to bear your whoredoms. You're going to bear your lies. You're going to bear the iniquity of your sins. And you're going to do this for 40 years, wandering in the wilderness. Doing this for God, doing this so that they could have liberty, and yet losing it all. Now, here's what I was getting at with reading the gospel story about the death and the resurrection of Christ. All of us experience this in, in various ways when somebody that we know dies we have a hard time with it sometimes we get mad at God because God took our loved one away from us be they young or be they old everybody experiences this in one in one form or another you have someone that you love, someone that you have, so, you have uh, given your life over for. You've done everything in the world for this person. This person has done things for you. You love each other. You care about one another. And then God decides to take one of you home to be with him and leave the other one here on this earth. We have women in this church who God decided to take their husband and take them home to be with Jesus. That leaves them with this emptiness that really there isn't anybody in this world that can fill that emptiness. Chil uh, children losing adults and grandparents. Adults losing children to death. Death takes us all, whether we are old or whether we are young. And when we love these people that died, just as the disciples, the apostles, loved Jesus, when he died, they may have asked, what was it all for? If all that I got out of this was a dead Savior, then what is there left to do? There is no religion greater than the one that we have. The person that you're married to, there is no one greater in this world for you than that person. And yet that person is now gone. Or maybe a child that has died. There, that's your child. That's your, your life's blood. And yet when God takes that child, sometimes we get angry, sometimes we get hurt, we get upset. Maybe we get angry at God. Been there, done that. But I'm going to show you something. Look at Job chapter 8. Look it up on the screen. One of Job's friends said, Though thy beginning was small, Yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Now this was said concerning Job. And if you look at the last chapter of the book of Job, Job 42 verse 12, the Bible says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep 
and six thousand camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. He even got kids back because he had lost his children. They were all murdered. And if, I think if you look in the Bible, I think he got double the kids back. He got double everything back that he had. The, the sheep, the camels, the oxen, uh, the, the donkeys or the she asses. All of those things God had doubled back to him. So it truly can be said that Job's latter end was far better than his beginning. Do you believe that? Say amen. You see, that's because it is of God. If God does it, that's the way God does it. So in this world right now, right now there may be somebody watching, somebody sitting here, somebody watching online, somebody listening to me. And you've lost something that you've spent your life with. And it angers you and it upsets you. Maybe it's, maybe it's somebody you love. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe they died. And yet, if that wife was saved, which is better? For God to bring the wife back to this world or for God to take the husband and put him where the wife is. Which is better? The second one. Amen? Wouldn't you rather be in heaven than sitting here with me right now? Thank you for that, amen? I'll remember you Christmas time. Look at Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. When they built Solomon's temple, it was the greatest structure, most glorious known to man. Glorious because the Spirit of God dwelt in that house. And yet that house was torn down. It was destroyed. The Israelites are released back to Jerusalem from uh, Babylonian captivity. They've been there 70 years and they come back. The walls of the city are broken down and now the house of God is broken down. Did they give up? Did they quit? No. They called upon the name of the Lord and God promised them, I'm going to rebuild the house. I'm going to rebuild the city. And when I do it the second time, it's going to be better than the first time. Are you catching me now? The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now who in here believes that the, he didn't say the second house, did he? Because they actually built a temple after this. And you know where it is now? Scattered all over the place. They tore it down too. So he couldn't have been talking about the second house. He was talking about the latter house. The one that, watch this now, the one that Jesus himself is going to build. Amen? So which, out of the two now, if I was offering you a deal, and you had paid me a million dollars for a temple for God, and I offered you Solomon's temple... Or I offered you the latter house that Jesus himself builds. Which would you take? This one. Right? Jeremiah 31, 31. In fact, turn your Bible here. Jeremiah 31, 31. I'm moving now. I'm, I'm moving on. I'm trying to hurry. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Now, let me stop right here for a minute, since we mentioned Egypt here. And let's, let's take our themes that I've been preaching here for the last several Sundays into this. Remember, A, maybe you're in a group of people 
that are addicted to certain things. You're addicted to drugs. You're addicted to uh, pharmaceutical drugs. And I don't mean that addicted in the sense that you have to take them uh, because of symptoms that you have. I don't mean addiction like that. I mean you, you, you just take it because it makes you feel good. Okay? Uh, I have, I, I'll be honest with you. I never smoked a cigarette. I don't know how it feels. But supposedly, when you see people take that drag after... I guess it feels good, right? I might make a smoker. I'll never be a smoker. I might make one one of these days. Or you taste that whiskey. Feels good going down. Feels good hitting your body. You get that tingly all over. Feels good. But if I were to ask you which out of the two lives, the clean life, where you're not addicted to drugs or alcohol or porn or anything like that, or the life where you get all the drugs, all the alcohol, all the porn you want, which life would you rather have? The free one. The one where you're free from that stuff. Amen? So what that means is, watch this. God has to destroy this one. So that this one could be in your life. You can't have both of them. You cannot put new wine into old bottles, can you? Because the bottles will rip and you'll lose the wine. That's why Jesus said that. He's telling you this lesson. If you want the old life, if you want the old covenant, Mount Sinai, go for it. But be careful because you have to keep every single one of God's laws, all 10 of them, and you must keep them spotless because if you break just one, one time, it's over with. So out of the two covenants, the covenant where you must perform and be perfect all of your life. Or the covenant that allows for you to fall every now and then. That allows for you that you will sin from time to time. But that, that God then covers that sin with grace and mercy. Which one would you rather have? Yeah. Yeah. Not according, verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them even to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at that. In fact, turn your Bible here. This is, I think this is the last verse. Yeah, look at here. Last verse. And this is actually the verse that, that had I put it first, I would have just finished the sermon right after this one. And I had it first, but I moved it to the last. Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to see this in your Bible. And, and the reason why I brought up the disciples. When Jesus was here the first time, he came to earth as a man. Now, how far that we know, how far did Jesus travel throughout his three and a half years ministry? 
In other words, did he make it to Siberia? Did Jesus uh, travel to Asia and preach up there around China and places like that? Did Jesus go to uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Europe, Italy? Did Jesus go to any of those places? Did Jesus come to the New World? If you're a Mormon, he did. Okay, but he didn't go to those places, did he? He couldn't. His, because of his physical body, his, his movements were limited to just a small area. That's that Jesus. But that Jesus died. And there was one that rose again from the dead. So, and he left, and he ascended on high, and he's there uh, 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 interceding for you and me to his heavenly father so that when we pray, our father hears our prayers, amen. One of these days, he's coming back. But when he comes back, the Bible says that every eye shall see him. He's coming back in a different manner, isn't he? So which would you rather have? The Jesus who can't come here because he's limited in his movements because of his flesh body. Or the Jesus that can appear to the entire world. Which Jesus would you rather have? The second one is always better than the first one. Amen. Out of the two births that you've had, which one was better? Your first birth or your second birth? Second birth. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. We are that body. Now, we're the body of his second coming, not his first. In uh, burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Notice this. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. I think of uh, some of the men and some of the people that have passed away out of this church in recent years. David and Linda Toomey. First David passed away and then Linda passed away. When David passed away, I'm sure that Linda spent many a night wishing that her husband was still there. Especially when you lay down at night and you're used to them being there next to you and they're not there. I'm quite sure that some of our widow ladies, my mother included, laying down in her bed at night, wishing that my dad was still there, but he's not. And there's not anything she can do about it. Brother Roy wishing that Bonnie was still by his side. Bonnie's the reason why Roy is still alive today. But the truth of it is, is that God had to take away the first so that he could establish the second. Y'all understand that now? God had to take the old dad and 
Brother George, I wish my dad would have been around to see that carp. He would have been jealous. He might have, he might have gotten into a fist fight with you over it. He caught a 20-pound catfish one time, and Mom said she's never seen him that excited before. It was out at Lake Kincaid. For a while, he thought he had a snapping turtle on the end. He had a trot line hanging out there and uh, thought he had a snapping turtle, and he was ready to cut that line and pulls up this 20-pound cat. And he's going, oh, Judy, get the net, get the net, get the net. He would have enjoyed seeing your 97-pound crop or carp crappie that would have been something <laughs> as much as I miss my dad I'll take the second one over the first one the first one struggled the second one no more when the disciples lost Jesus they thought that it was over with but he's coming back and he's bringing his saints with him. And when he does, there's not going to be any more remembrance of what used to be. Only what is now and what the future holds. And when it comes to your life, listen to me now. When it comes to your life, Jesus said, behold... I make all things new. When we have addictions, would you rather live the life and keep the addictions or live a better life without them? When it comes to those dreams and goals that you have for your life or for your marriage, for your children would you rather live in the old style where there's constant turmoil constant problem or would you rather have a new lease on life they call it a new life would you rather have it the new way or the old way would you rather have God give you the second one or the first one According to scriptures, I'm taking the second one. When I look back on my life, really before God got a hold of me and dealt with me back in the mid-90s, I'm telling you, the life that I live now is far better than the one that I lived back then. And I wouldn't trade this life for nothing. All the people that we've lost to heaven, don't be mad at God. If, you're, if your loved one is a saint of the living God, they're living it up right now. Do you think they're thinking of you and crying? Nope. They're enjoying the paradise that God has made for them. And they're going to enjoy it for eternity. It's never going to get old. So I want you to remember this morning. As Jesus rises from the dead. He's declaring to the world. Behold I make all things new. He'll make a marriage new again. He'll make your life new. He'll take away the old life with its deeds and its remembrances of how bad things were. And God will give you what they, what they call a new lease on life. You get a second chance with God. A year ago, I kicked my son out of my house. For breaking some pretty serious rules. After about two months he called. We talked. Said he wanted to come home. And I asked him do you want a bed and a shower. Or do you want a second chance. And that took him by surprise. And finally he said. 
I want a second chance. Last night, after we got home, I took him to a side before we went in the house. And I said, this time last year, you were living in the back seat of your car. But now, you're a different person. And I see that. And I just want you to know I'm proud of you. He still needs to know the Lord. He knows it. But he's a different young man than he was this time last year. And God did it. Think of yourself. See if God needs to do something in your life to give you a new life. Or think of somebody that you know. And you know that that whole situation needs to be brand new again. But God's got to take away the old first. Because you can't have both. Let's stand and bow our heads.